Good to see everybody tonight. I appreciate your presence. A uh, number of folks have uh, driven a good ways to be here tonight, and I appreciate seeing you. It's good to see uh, old friends and faces from a lot of different places uh, tonight. So thank you for coming. I hope that our study will be profitable to you. I would ask you to open your Bibles and put your bookmark in Psalm 51, uh, which is where we're going to spend our time this evening, although I'm not going to start there. So if you put your bookmark in Psalm 51 and, and then turn over to the 6th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Uh, I want to start in Ezekiel chapter 6 and then go to Psalm 51. So I hope you had a good day today. Appreciate your uh, interest in spiritual things and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with uh, this good church again uh, through the week. And uh, we have... Uh, uh, enjoyed very much being here. Thank you for your, the kindness that you've shown, especially to my family. Uh, we don't get to do this very often, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's been a joy in some ways. Uh, I, you know, when I go to meetings by myself, I'm never late for anything. And so far, uh, I've been late for everything. That's because all my girls are with me. So uh, uh, I brought a little frustration, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it sure is good to have them uh, with me this week. In Ezekiel chapter 6, uh, God offers a, a kind of a condemnation, if you would. Uh, uh, Ezekiel, if you have studied Ezekiel, you, you know a little of the background. Ezekiel is a, a prophet that God had chosen to deliver his word to the children of Israel who had been taken captive to Babylon before the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, God had been working through Jeremiah predominantly for about uh, 20 years when Ezekiel comes on the scene. And uh, when Jehoiakim is dethroned and Jehoiachin, his son, is carried off and Zedekiah is placed upon the throne, Nebuchadnezzar takes captive uh, really what uh, amounts to the, uh, the potential uh, economic and military future of Judah. He, he takes about 10,000 captives carries them off to Judea, and for another 10 or 11 years, uh, those people are living, I said in Judea, he took them off to Babylon, and, and those people are living in Babylon while the city and the temple are still standing in Jerusalem. And through most of Ezekiel's prophecy, the, 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 the nation as a nation is still in existence. They haven't all been taken into captivity, and the temple hasn't been destroyed. And God is, is essentially doing the same thing through Ezekiel in Babylon that He was doing through Jeremiah in Judah. And, and the message was, uh, you're going to lose this battle. Uh, and, and, and so here's what I want you to do to get ready for the future. I want you to start looking ahead. Jeremiah is doing all he can essentially to save the city. I, I'm personally convinced that if Zedekiah had listened to Jeremiah, the city wouldn't have been destroyed. But they still were going to go into captivity. And, and the message of Ezekiel is a message essentially of get ready to repent. Here's the lesson that I want you to learn. And so Ezekiel has a lot to say about how all of this process of captivity and destruction and failure how that's supposed to impact these people. I, I want you to notice three or four verses in Ezekiel chapter 6. This is, this is very powerful imagery, as most of Ezekiel is. And in this particular passage, God is speaking to the, to the geography of, of, of Judah, to the mountains. And basically what he's saying is, all of these people that I have put upon you to bless you are going to die. I'm going to slaughter them. It's, a, it's an ugly picture. And so I want to start reading uh, in verse 4 and read through verse 10. Your altars will be desolate. Your incense altars will be broken. I will cast down your slain men before your idols. I will lay the corpses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones all around your altars. In all your dwelling places, the cities will be laid waste, and the high places will be desolate, so that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate. Your idols may be broken and made to cease. Your incense altars may be cut down, and your works may be abolished. The slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Yet I will leave a remnant, so that you may have some who escape the sword among the nations, when you are scattered throughout the countries. Then those of you who escape 
will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive, because I was crushed by their adulterous heart which has departed from me, and by their eyes which play the harlot after themselves, uh, after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evils that they have committed in all of their abominations, and they will know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would bring this calamity upon them. It's interesting to see how God tries to appeal to His people in captivity in these passages. Uh, he, he, as I already have mentioned, is very brutal in His imagery, and, and the brutality is when it all came to pass, was actually a pretty accurate description of what was going to happen to so many people in Judah. And, and yet, God is looking at this captive group that's off in, in Babylon, and, and He's trying to prepare them to come home. And, and Ezekiel has a lot to say about how all of this process is going to affect their thinking, about their heart. I want you to notice, if you would, in the reading, especially verse 9. When he talks about those who escape from the sword and are carried captive, and the fact that he says, I was crushed by their adulterous heart that is departed from me. As the book of Ezekiel goes on and God offers more and more instruction, he, he talks more and more about their heart, about the fact that, that the process is going to change their heart, that their spirit is going to change and their heart is going to change. And, 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 and the way that they think is going to be impacted by God's judgment and their failure and the opportunity that they have to be restored. I find it interesting because it is this heart of man that God has always appealed to. It is just so very obvious in Ezekiel, and, and, and the story in Ezekiel is so very graphic. I'm going to destroy a whole nation so that those that remain will change their heart. That's what God says. If you go to the book of Luke in the New Testament, we're familiar with Luke's account of the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8. And and, and the, the seed that falls on the wayside, and the seed that falls among the thorns, and the seed that falls in the stony ground, and the seed that falls in the good soil. And, and in Luke's account, Jesus makes it very clear that the difference between those soils and the productivity of such is the heart of the people involved. And, and, and this Old Testament image becomes very much a prominent part of what Jesus teaches. I, I was in... A Bible study with a bunch of preachers, which is always a kind of a dangerous thing. But uh, several years ago in Dallas, and we were talking about the Luke chapter 8. And, and the good and honest heart. That, that's, the, that, that's the old King James rendering uh, of, of the good soil. It's those who have a good and honest heart. And the question arose in the Bible study, uh, what is it that makes a good and honest heart in people? And... Of course, everybody has a bunch of ideas like preachers do. And after everybody was finished showing everybody else how smart they were with all of their answers, somebody finally said, I think the person who has the good and honest heart is the person who decides they will have a good and honest heart. And I happen to agree with that. In fact, in Ezekiel, if you get over to chapter 36, where once again God talks about the heart of man, and He talks about changing the heart of man and taking the heart of stone out of man and, and putting a heart of flesh in man and a new heart and a new spirit. One of the things that God says repeatedly, and actually He first says it in Ezekiel chapter 18 is, I want you to get yourself a new heart. The point I want to make from all this is God expects us to be impacted by, by what He has done by judgment, by redemption, by His activities in the world. And that impact is to change the way we think, and that is within our control. Now having said all that, I want you to turn back to Psalm 51. Now what I want to talk with you about this evening is uh, our hearts and sin. And, and the kind of impact that that sin and redemption is to have on us. And, and let, let, me, let me offer at the outset, uh, I have a hard time preaching from the Psalms. Um, the, the Psalms are, are expressions of emotion. And, and uh, John and I were talking yet last night about uh, the process of inspiration and how it all works. And, 
Uh, the Psalms are an interesting uh, uh, aspect of inspiration because many of the Psalms are intended to help us appreciate the kind of feelings that are natural in our service to God. Even to the fact that some of the Psalms are uh, imprecatory in nature. God, destroy my enemies. And we've all felt that. Well, uh, I have a hard time preaching from the Psalms uh, because while I feel all this stuff, my tendency is to want to analyze to death pretty much everything. And it's hard to get three points and a conclusion out of a lot of these psalms because they are intended to simply express the kind of emotion that comes from service. And that's what's happening in this psalm. If, the, if you have a marginal note, and most people do at the beginning of the 51st psalm, most Bibles include this, you'll notice that the marginal note, which is not inspired, says, A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. If you look at the biblical reference to that passage, this is found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And you know the story of David and Bathsheba and David's sin and then the murder of Bathsheba's husband so that David could take Bathsheba as his own wife. And Nathan the prophet comes in and tells him the little parable about the man with the sheep and David becomes very upset and Nathan convicts him, you are the one... Uh, and, and, and David acknowledges, I have sinned against God. And interestingly enough in that passage, Nathan immediately tells him, God has put away your sin and you're not going to die. Now I want you to think about that for a moment as we start to look at the 51st Psalm. Because while David is expressing great emotion about his sin, he's also speaking as a man who's already been forgiven. If, if, the, if, if, Psalm, if, if 2 Samuel chapter 12 is accurate, then David knows that God has put away his sin. And yet, this kind of emotion is pouring out of the man. And the older I get, the more I study this, the, the more I am convinced that God placed this here in the way that He did because there are some very valuable things for us to learn, even those of us who have already been Christians, even those of us who have been forgiven. And, and, and what I want to do with this is I, I want to help us to, to look a little bit at the impact of our failures upon our heart. So, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous Spirit, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they will offer bulls on your altar. Let me make a couple of observations to you that, that strike me about this psalm. And, and the first one is that as I look at David and what he did and how he felt about it, that maybe part of what God is trying to help us to appreciate is that the, the reality of our failures, the, the reality of our transgressions, the, 
the resounding experience of our sin, it ought to crush us. Uh, if you've studied Paul's writings much, have you noticed how many times Paul looks back at his background and talks about the fact, for instance, 1 Timothy chapter 1, that he's the chief of all sinners and that he was a persecutor and an insolent man and a blasphemer and in his own mind he never deserved to be uh, a, an apostle of God, much less did, than in his own mind he deserved the mercy of God. Paul remains conscious, even years later when he's done great things in his service to God, he remains conscious of his failures. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, the, I think that's a healthy thing. <laughs> it's not the way that we typically approach the concept of sin. We, we typically approach the concept of sin by saying, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't hold on to our sin and our guilt. Now, I'm not arguing that we hold on to our guilt, folks. It is important to understand that we are forgiven when we are forgiven, but, but I do believe that we should never forget our failures. Because what our failures do for us is they keep us grounded, and here's the reason. Because they help us to see, or they should remind us of, God's disposition. When we read Ezekiel 6 a while ago, did you notice that God said, I was crushed by their adulterous heart? In the 78th Psalm, the, the psalmist there talks about uh, the, the children of Israel and their failures in the wilderness. And, and the psalmist there says that God was grieved by their transgression. Have you ever thought about the fact that what happens in your life and what happens in my life affects God? I doubt that most of us would see ourselves as being significant enough that God is ever impacted by what we have done. And yet, when God looks at the children of Israel and what they did, He said, I was crushed. I was crushed by what they did to me. I was grieved by the things that they were doing. I don't think that that's just a poetic language that's intended just to kind of be dramatic. I, I... You have children? When they mess up, does it hurt you? Does, does it affect you? Does it impact you? Even if they haven't messed up against you, but particularly if they do. I've got two teenagers still. Love them dearly. Want to kill them about once a month, but I love them dearly. And I must tell you, when we have a little incident and attitudes aren't all they're supposed to be, it kills me. It, it absolutely kills me. And there's no way that they can understand this. I've tried to tell them. They'll understand it when they have their own. And, and I'm just now starting to appreciate the way that my parents feel. And, and I tell you, folks, I, I really believe that God would have us to understand from these statements that He makes about us crushing Him and us grieving Him that our failures impact God emotionally. What scares me is that they don't impact us. You read the 51st Psalm. Do you think that David felt bad about what he had done? Do you? Do you remember our, our little Bible class rule for the week? This is yes, this is no. Okay, this is one of those times. Not a rhetorical question. Do you think in reading the 51st Psalm that David felt bad about what he had done? Yeah, of course he did. Why? He's a forgiven man. Well, yes, he's a forgiven man, but he also appreciates what he has done to his father. And that, I think, is the key. L listen, listen to what he says. My sin, he says, is ever before me. You know, David's child, David and Bathsheba's child, according to 2 Samuel chapter 12, appears to have been born fairly quickly after Nathan had come to David. That, that's... That's the sense that you get reading the text. Because Nathan says the child you're about to have is, is going to die. And I find that interesting because that means that David went maybe as much as three quarters of a year carrying around the weight of murdering Uriah and committing adultery with Bathsheba knowing that he had done wrong. And it's a long time before Nathan comes to him 
And, and don't you know, as conscientious a man as David appears to be in the Scriptures, that, that truly his sin was ever before him. And, and even though Nathan says, God's put away your sin, David didn't just turn off the emotions of what he had done. My sin, he says, is ever before me. Uh, against you, he says, and you only I have done this evil. In fact, one of the hardest parts about the psalm is also one of the most poignant in verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. This is poetry, folks. I don't think it means that, that David was the product of some kind of illicit relationship, or that David was born in sin in some kind of inherited way. I think what David is saying is, I am such a pitiable man. It's almost as if from the very day I was born, I was guilty. I think that's the way he's describing himself as he looks at his own life and as he is impacted by his failures. In the Beatitudes, when Jesus begins to describe the heart of the man who will be the citizen of the kingdom of heaven, have you, have you ever connected that to these kinds of thoughts? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You, you want to know who a you, you want to know who a poor in spirit, mourning, meek man is? It's someone who looks at himself and sees someone that is a miserable failure without Jehovah God. That's who a meek, poor in spirit, mourning man is. And, and, and that man may well have been forgiven. But Jesus doesn't say in the Beatitudes, blessed are you in these regards as long as you're poor in spirit and you're mourning and you're meek until you're forgiven. And once you're forgiven, that whole attitude can change. Why is that important? Because, because it reminds us of of how desperately we need what God has done for us. It, it, it guards us against pride. It guards us against a hardened heart. Hebrews chapter 3, the Hebrew writer warns those people that they do not like, become like Old Testament Israel who, are, who had hardened their hearts to God's blessings, to God's provision, to God's deliverance. And, and at the same time, we need to be careful that we do not adopt perverted views of mercy because the other end of the spectrum from a hard heart is this kind of mentality that says, well, you know, God's a God of love and God forgives me, and God loves me, and God's merciful. It, it, it is Calvinism gone to seed. And, and I guess if there's any one aspect of this lesson that seems to me to grow out of modern thinking, it is that. Do you know people who call themselves Christians just kind of live however they want to? Uh, don't necessarily abide by God's standards in this area or that. They might be pretty decent moral people, but they don't necessarily dress modestly. And, and, and they may abuse alcohol from time to time. And, and, and they, may, they may cheat on their taxes a little bit. And they're basically pretty nice people, and they would be nice to you. But you look at them and you say, yeah, you know, you make great claims to Christianity, but you're, you're not being very godly. That may be the case for some of our folks. Why are we that way? Well, you know, we live in a world where most people who call themselves Christians have adopted the mentality that uh, God's grace is everything. That, that the sovereignty of God is, is so overwhelming that I can't sin so as to be lost. And that, and that God's working in my life and... And, and even if I mess up, God is there to take care of it and wipe things away. And, you know, Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I'm going to tell you what being conscious of our failures does. It, it reminds us that my spiritual relationship revolves around my standing before God and what He has done for me. That left to myself, I am a miserable failure. And so David, in verse 4, says, Against you and you only I have sinned. Well, technically that's not true, is it? Sinned against Bathsheba, sinned against Uriah. I would argue sinned against Joab for having him 
uh, complicit in the, in the conspiracy to commit Uriah. David sinned against a lot of people, but what David's grand concern in his life was, when I sinned, I messed things up with you, God. Let me ask you something. In your service to God, is that what you worry about more than anything else? Where you stand with God? How God feels about you? Someone mentioned yesterday uh, at the potluck, that, uh, or maybe in the foyer after services, that you know, service to God is really an issue of bringing honor and glory to Him. I, I, I think that's a true statement. What if you found out this evening that God's really disappointed with you? <laughs> There's no Andy Griffith episode you, 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 where Opie is uh, learning to throw a fit to try to get the way what, what, what he wants from his dad. There's a, a, a poor influence on him in town. And, and Andy looks over the desk and Opie's pitching a fit and, and Andy's just not buying into that. He, he sees what's going on and... Finally, when it's all said and done and Opie realizes he's not going to get his way, Andy, Andy pulls him to the side and sits him down and says, Son, I'm disappointed in you. And Opie just falls into a puddle on the floor. Because what's clear in that episode is his relationship with his dad means more to him than anything else. Is that the way we think? When it is, and we look at our failures, Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When that becomes the way we think, folks, then, then our conscience is becoming attuned to service to God in a way that's going to be profitable in our lives. So the, the, the first point, and, and really what, what I think is, is the biggest point that I would make to you this evening is you learn from this psalm that, that, that our sins and our failures and our past, and we look at how we stand before, that, that ought to just absolutely crush us. But I don't think that's all that's here. Let, let me secondly point out to you that those same feelings that... that, that disturb us and crush us as we think about God being disappointed, that they also move us. The very first verse of this psalm is an appeal. Have mercy on me, O God. When, when David looks at what he has done, in, instead, of, instead of reacting like the apostle uh, Judas who, realizing that, that he has sinned against God, goes out in despair and hangs himself, well, what David does is he turns right back to God. And his appeal is that God would, would accept him again. I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but the idea of God accepting us every day of our lives, that ought to be a very powerful incentive to get up every day and, and try to serve Him and try to improve and try to do better. What David wants is mercy. The Hebrew word for mercy, as, as I have found it defined, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, the Hebrew word is defined to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. That, that's the picture. It's the picture of one who is in power actually doing this to bring up the one who has, who has failed. The, the New Testament picture that I think kind of conveys that idea and, and, and the desire for such, in Matthew chapter 18, when Jesus is talking about the relationship between disciples, and Peter asks Jesus, if my brother sinned against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? Do, do I forgive him seven times? And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And then Jesus tells the parable about the, the man who is in debt. You remember that parable? And, 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 and the debt is something like millions of dollars in our economy. And, and, and he has nothing to pay. And as he goes before the master to whom he is indebted, you see him falling down and begging for mercy. And, and, and the master who doesn't have to, to, to forgive him, is, 
is compassionate, is caring, is forgiving, and then expects the man to go off and do the same. That's what we're after. And, and, and here's the more powerful consideration. Is that's what God's after. You know what God wants from you and I? He wants people that every time we mess up or every time we are conscious of our own failures are, are the people that are begging for God to take us back or appreciative of the fact that God is taking us back, that God would even want to take us back. You ever disappointed a friend? You ever messed up in a relationship? Maybe even your spouse. Maybe you had some big fight, had some huge disappointment, and, and, and there is an estrangement, and, and, and your, your sense is there's, just, there's no way that they, could ever, that they could ever forgive me. There's no way that they could ever trust me, that there's no way we could ever be friends again, and yet your relationship to them is so valuable that, that they come to you, I, I want to make this right, I want to get things fixed back. What a relief that is. That's our God. That's the, the father in the story of the prodigal son. The, the son takes everything and, and walks off and wastes it, and the father is looking for him to come back down the road. We are undeserving of that. I don't know everybody in the audience. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe, maybe you've been invited here. Please understand that we are undeserving of God wanting to have us back. David's certainly conscious of that because David is begging. Have mercy on me. Take me back. Restore these things to me. I, I think it's fascinating that David recognizes that, that that's what God wants. David's an interesting character. He, he's always looking to this relationship. He's governing the most powerful country in that part of the world in his time, and yet all David seems to be concerned about all the time is where he stands before his God and God taking him back. And here we are, thousands of years later, we have the plan of redemption in front of us. We know all that God has done. We know the sacrifices He's made. We know the provisions He's made. And, and yet, for some reason or the other, we can't appreciate that God really wants to restore this relationship that we have messed up. And that ought to provide great incentive to us to, to do something about that. To put our confidence in Him. To, to repent of our sins. If, if, if you have no relationship, then, then you ought to be moved to the initial aspect of service to God. Take advantage of the sacrifice of Christ. Put your trust and live your life in regards to the way He has asked you to live. Confess your faith in Him, not just a one-time deal, but on a daily basis. Repent of the sins that you've committed. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. I'm going to tell you, if you're really worried about your sins, and you're really convinced that God has made great effort to bring you back home, then you're not going to have any hang-ups about what you need to do to have your sins forgiven. Whatever God says, I'm willing... Let's just fix this. And for those of us that are already Christians, I, I tell you one of the dangers of spiritual maturity is complacency. We're so accustomed to the idea of forgiveness that it doesn't mean anything to us anymore. That we don't appreciate how horrid we must be, the fact that we have crushed God, that He sees us as having an adulterous heart, that that we are deserving of eternal condemnation, and yet, to this very day, he, he still offers His Son. In Hebrews chapter 7, there's a statement that uh, I, I guess I've known about for years and years and years, but it's just been fairly recently that I, I thought about it to, to such a degree that it's really kind of made an impact. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, and this is the section where uh, the Hebrew writer is, is underscoring the priesthood of Christ. He makes the point in this verse, because he is a, an unchanging priest, because he's not a, a priest on the earth, because he lives forever. He, he says, Therefore he is able to save those to the uttermost who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. You know, Jesus didn't stop the work of redemption at 
at the resurrection and the ascension. He, he didn't die and then be raised and then go to heaven only to sit on His throne and just watch everything unfold. This very day, for every one of us who are children of God, Jesus has spoken on our behalf to the Father. Every day. He ever lives to make intercession. Are you deserving of that? What a powerful thought. That this is how much we mean to, to God that Jesus not only did something 2,000 years ago to fix the relationship, but every day since, He's interested in what's happening in your life, He's interested in what's happening in my life, He is interested in our standing, that relationship that we have with Him is important, and any time we come to the Father as the Father, He is speaking for us. That's powerful, folks. And that ought to move us, those of us who've been Christians, to try harder to live above sin, to try harder to be people who are spiritually minded as we're told in Romans chapter 8, to try harder to make sure that we're seeking things that are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, mortifying the things of the flesh, putting on the new man, that we try harder to walk in the light as He is in the light. You see, where we have been... And what God has offered to us, it ought to move us. No preacher or group of elders ought to ever have to stand before a group of brethren and beg them to come to worship services. Amen. Beg them to come to a gospel meeting. Beg them to, to take time to observe the Lord's Supper. Beg them to, to make sure that we bring glory to God in our lives. If that's not happening in your life because of your disposition about your sin and God's willingness to accept you, then you've got a problem. And the problem is your heart. David would have us to understand that fixing things with God, whatever he has to do, is the grand objective in life. Now turn back to Psalm 51 and, and let me make one last observation. The very end of this psalm, uh, did you notice that David begins with begging God, uh, have mercy on me, restore me, give me a clean heart again, restore me the fellowship of your spirit. All I want is to have everything made right with you again. But, but as he gets to the, to the latter part of that, I think probably beginning in, uh, in, well, in some ways in verses 8 and 9, but more prominently in verse 12, he starts saying, here's how this, here's how this is going to impact me. And, and this is the last observation that I will make. And, and that is what God has done in this process fixing us, helping us, receiving us as our heart is moved by the process, it ought to inspire us. It shouldn't just move us to faithfulness. It ought to inspire us. Inspire us, he says, to joy. Verse 8. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. We need some of that in our lives. Tracy tells me this pretty regularly because I tend to be a kind of a curmudgeon. No, I tend to be a whole lot of a curmudgeon. Rush, you need to find the joy. And, and she's right about that. For those of us that are Christians, th th there is always something in this life that's worthwhile. In, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, Peter begins by talking about the fact that we have been fathered by God. We have been, been begotten again. He doesn't talk about the new birth from the perspective of of, of, of our experience, that we're born again, what he says is you've been begotten. And he's looking at it from the perspective of what God has done. And he says what God has done is He has fathered you to an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and that doesn't fade away. And, and he says even though we may be grieved now, yet we still rejoice in what we have. Well, there's a lot of grief in life. There's a lot of heartache in life. There, there's, there's a lot of pressure in life. 
And, and, and I think we make a mistake if we think that as Christians, we should never feel that. Peter says, even though you are grieved. You, you know, bad things happen and it makes us sad, and that's not a sin. We act sometimes like that's a sin. No, it's not a sin. But what God expects is that, that we are, are, are spiritually minded enough to remember in the midst of all that who we are and where we're going. That in spite of the grief, there is joy. David's begging. I, I just, I am so overwhelmed with how terrible I, I, I am and the terrible things I have done. I need to find the joy again. And the, the joy is in the restoration. Our forgiveness ought to inspire us to steadfastness. Look at verse 10. Created me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. We need this in churches. I guarantee you this church needs this. The congregation, those of you that are visiting, the congregation where you are, you, you need people who are steadfast in their, in their heart, in their mind. The congregation where I am, we need people that are steadfast. People that are going to stand up, they're going to stand straight, they're going to keep this relationship with God foremost. You young people, this is what you're aiming for in your life. You need to be steadfast in your faith to God. David says, you know, when, when I appreciate what you have done and, and, and you've made my heart clean again and I am forgiven and our relationship is good, what I want, what I want is I want to be steadfast again. You know, there's only two sins of David mentioned in the Bible. Now, now I suspect that he sinned more than that. But I do find it interesting that as God paints this picture of this man after God's own heart, He doesn't tell us a whole lot about His failures. He tells us a whole lot about His successes. And my suspicion is that David was probably a pretty faithful man most of the time. He could have killed Saul. He could have killed Nabal. Hadn't been for Abigail, probably would have. He was a man who was steadfast. Don't you know when he looked at what he had done to... To, to with Bathsheba and to Uriah and the position he put Joab. Don't you know that David was just ashamed? Here I have stood up for my God all these years and now I have completely and utterly failed Him. What he wants is to, to be the person that's always standing fast. It's what we need to be. And, and that forgiveness ought to inspire us to that. To proclamation, verses 13 and 14. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. You want to know one of the most powerful incentives in the Bible to, to evangelism? It is, it's to say to people, and this is what Paul did. Look at where I came from. Look at the person that I used to be. Paul could stand up and say, hey, I used to kill people. People that I disagreed with in matters of religion, I used to just kill them. Now I suspect everybody here at some point in time has wanted to do that. Paul actually did it. And then he could turn around to the people that he's teaching and say, and yet, look at the grace that God has shown me. He, he hasn't just accepted me, he's made me his messenger. I, I don't know what all's happened to you in your life, what all things you've done, all the problems you've had, all the the mistakes that you've made, but I'm going to tell you what forgiveness ought to do for you. It will cause you to, to be willing to stand up in anyone and, and say, I, I want you to see what my God has done for me. And, and I don't want you to, to feel like that, that there's anything that He can't forgive, that there's anybody that He wouldn't receive. Forgiveness ought to move us to, to proclamation, to praise, to sing out, to speak out, to tell people about the God that we serve. We live in a society that uh, downplays sin. And that sin's not a huge thing. That, uh, you know, we, we, we serve a good and a, and, and a gracious God and and you don't have to worry too much about your failures and your sins. And, you know, things aren't that bad. Yeah, everybody's pretty much accepting of this stuff. And, and we often all make arguments, well, we're only human. You know, what do you expect? We're only human. 
Oh, no, we're not only human. We're made in the image and likeness of God. We can't buy into the mindset that says sin's not a big deal and that God's grace takes care of everything. The, the reality is, folks, we still have to grapple with this and not have an impact in our lives. Even if you've gone for months without sinning, that doesn't mean that you didn't in the past. And like Paul, I don't think we ought to ever forgive it. Forget it. I, I, like David, this, this needs to make a, a difference. It, it ought to crush us. It ought to move us. And in the end, the forgiveness of God ought to inspire us so that our service to God comes naturally because we are people of a broken and contrite heart because that's what God's after. He, he wants our heart to change. And so I, I hope those will give you some stuff to think about. Uh, and... Uh, it, I, I hope it'll move you a little bit. I, I hope what David has to say, what the Lord has done, and the kind of attitude he has toward us in spite of our failings, I, I hope you'll be moved by that. Maybe you need to obey the gospel. Maybe now's the time to go ahead and start that. Maybe you've done that and you've messed up and you've just not taken care of it. Maybe you think God could never accept you, that God could never love you, that, I mean... David killed a man, took his wife away, and forgave him. And David was moved by that. Fix things with God. If we could help you to do that tonight, we invite you to come. While together we stand and while we sing.